Let me do that. Um, all right, give me one second. Um, I just have to swap those. How's that? All right, so uh, so good evening and good day, uh, or good morning, wherever you're joining. I, I like to uh, thank the organizers uh, for the honor to be part of this prestigious uh, event. And it's my pleasure to, to talk um, to you to, about the current strategies for addressing the world's leading cause of death. So you see here a, a a plot of the global death rates. Uh, and uh, you, you may not make out all the, the, uh, the minor details here because of the fine print, but the point of this is to show that these are all um, you know, the predominant causes of, of, of death worldwide. And many cancers here, infectious diseases. Uh, and at the very top though, there is uh, ischemic heart disease. So indeed coronary heart disease is the leading cause of death worldwide. So shown here is a, a map of the world, you know, with the country specific mortality rates of coronary artery disease. Uh, and it's uh, the color coded from deep blue, which is the lowest rate to, to red, the highest rate. And you can see here worldwide that we still have, you know, overall uh, quite substantial you know, mortality rates of coronary disease, but particularly uh, I'm sorry, uh, particularly up here in, in Russia, in, in the neighboring countries of Russia. And you see Iran here, which is kind of like in the middle uh, and uh, certainly affected by, by coronary artery disease. Now, what is interesting, uh, particularly interesting, I'd say, is if you look at the trends, uh, and I'm showing you now the mortality rate trends in the US, but the the, the trends are overall the same. And, uh, and these are the trends um, from 1900 you know, to the end of the century. And uh, so what you can see here is, this is broken down by infectious diseases and non-infectious causes. And while we made great strides in, in, in terms of reducing the mortality from infectious diseases, and you know, particularly you know, through the uh, event or the invention rather of antibiotics, you see that the non-infectious causes actually stayed the same. Yeah, so we, we didn't make, it seemed like we didn't really make uh, progress, you know, in, in particularly addressing mortality rates from, from coronary heart disease. And that's despite the fact that there's obviously quite you know, effective medications out there. So we, you know, we made progress on one hand, but there's some other forces which offset that progress. And uh, some of the other forces or, or, or developments rather is that we are all becoming more overweight. Yeah, so these are the body mass index, EMI, body mass index trends in the world for men on the left and for, uh, for females, for women on the right. And this is they're color coded here for regions uh, in the world um, the screen being, you know, high income nations, uh, red, you know, is, is, is Middle East and um, uh, then uh, South America and, uh, and uh, Central Asia is here. And then we have some of the regions which traditionally, you know, have had lower body mass index such as uh, South or East Asia rather and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. But the point is that the trends are all going up. Yeah, so we're all becoming more and more overweight. And this is actually in a fairly short time frame. You know, we'd be looking here at 25 years and our BMI, uh, average uh, BMI body mass index increases. Now, you know that in America, yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, the majority of, of adults are overweight now. You know, and then we have a, a huge problem with obesity. So these are the things which uh, kind of fueling uh, the coronary artery disease um, you know, mortality rates. And, and with that, with a higher BMI body mass index, they're tracking other risk factors like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. Uh, and so this is the, the true problem that, that this is 
you know, in many ways, a, a, a self-made problem because obviously uh, these things you know, can, be, can be prevented. And then we still smoke too much. So this is the prevalence of smoking in the world. Uh, again, can have color coded here, but red is the worst. And, uh, and you can see that in many countries, uh, particularly Europe, a fairly high prevalence of smoking and there's some places like Greece and it's excessive rates of smoking, which, you know, fueling, fueling uh, the death rates from coronary artery disease. Okay, but it's not, you know, a huge issue in terms of morbidity and mortality. It's also a huge cost issue. So I'm showing you here now the US expenditure for cardiovascular diseases from 2015 through to, uh, projected to 2035. And it's broken down what we're spending money for. So uh, this is the hospital cost, and then there are physician cost uh, and uh, medication cost. The key things here, we are 2020. So we are spending well over $200 billion every year to treat you know, cardiovascular diseases. Now that is more than many countries have as a GDP. Uh, it is an unbelievable amount. And not only is that an unbelievable amount, uh, as you can see in, in, within a few years, it's projected to essentially double. You know, we're looking at $400 billion, more than $400 billion if you count all costs. Now we're 2035. It's an incredible burden on our society. Uh, the other point I'd like to make here is that the, that the major driver for costs are hospitalization. Yeah. So all the other ones are important, but hospitalization is driving the cost. There's a ways to, to prevent hospitalization is a major, it's a major um, you know, goal for all major societies. Okay, so what to do? Well, simply put, what we need to do is you need to, you need to have better pre primary prevention and better secondary prevention. Uh, so primary prevention uh, deals uh, at, at preventing uh, the manifestation of, uh, of coronary disease. So that's the early stages of prevention. Uh, so put in some simple categories, you know, what, what are strategies? Uh, so you heard uh, from uh, Professor Lighthill in this excellent lecture about education. So a big portion, you know, has to be, you know, uh, education uh, about, um, about the factors leading to coronary artery disease. It's astounding that at this time still there is a, a lack of awareness of how many factors uh, like being overweight, high cholesterol, smoking, uh, and the direct uh, relationship, you know, to development of atherosclerosis. So we should probably start in childhood, you know, in, in, in school and have systematic education to children uh, that teaches them what leads to, to become overweight uh, and uh, to develop risk factors. Um, the government and, and our society, the leadership can do a lot, you know, so we, we can, and we do in many countries, we regulate uh, certain uh, offenders or, or um, uh, you know, items like tobacco, sugar, you know, which contribute you know, to obesity or directly to coronary disease. So tobacco should be taxed you know, because uh, it, it is a major contributor to coronary disease. Uh, so, so it should be even taxed higher that it makes it very difficult for people to attain it. And you know, not many people talk about taxing sugar, but sugar uh, is, is in fact you know, a major uh, problem uh, leading to uh, obesity in, in, um, in our country and, and worldwide. So there are ways to do that, you know, it takes political wealth. Often these things are unpopular, but they are possible. Uh, improving air quality is, is very important. Uh, pollution you know, contributes to coronary disease. Again, something that we as a society can do if we have the political will to do that. Um, and then there are ways to incentivize fitness. Uh, you can you know, give lower insurance premiums to people who have normal body mass index. So there's a lot of ways to do this. So these are simple categories, but many folks, you know, particularly Valentin Fuster, uh, in Mount Sinai uh, in New York, you know, has outlined very specific prescriptions uh, how to improve primary prevention, how to overcome you know, barriers uh, to um, uh, build uh, programs and advocacy and funding 
to implement programs and policy you know, recognizing coronary heart disease as a chronic condition, uh, how to improve data management and research, and then finally to do global coordination such that uh, the information on all we're gathering in one country can be used in other countries. So very much uh, according to the, uh, to the uh, objectives of USAN, you know, just have a global approach uh, to a disease and not, you know, a, just a local, um, local, local approach. Okay, now talking now from a physician standpoint, so these are things you know, in terms of a society, but from a physician standpoint, what we do is we see patients and then typically um, at, you know, assess their risk for coronary artery disease. And we do that in, in, in many countries, you know, using something which is a risk score, a, you know, an atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk score. That's a simple calculator, which you can download from the internet or have an app uh, where you plug in your age, uh, your gender, and your risk factors such as blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol, and, and it will give you a 10 year predicted uh, risk for manifestations of coronary artery disease. And that's typically one and greater than 20%. Uh, and, uh, and then based on these categories, you know, if you're very low risk uh, or very high risk uh, or intermediate risk, you know, there's specific uh, recommendations. These guidelines, practice guidelines, were just released last year, so they're very current. Uh, and mostly regard, it's in regard to you know, the, the use of medications such as uh, statins, cholesterol-lowering medications, or antiplatelet inhibitors such as aspirin. So these, you know, work, you know, quite, quite well. Um, uh, and uh, it is one approach. Another approach actually uh, is to treat patients, you know, regardless. And that was a, a is an approach called uh, the polypill approach. And it essentially was, uh, it was pioneered here in, in Iran. You know, there was a, a phenomenal study called the poly-Iran uh, study uh, which was authored by some of my um, friends and co uh, colleagues, uh, like Dr. Stomane. And, uh, in, in what they did here is they, they assessed the effectiveness of a polypill approach for, for actually both primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. It was a pragmatic cluster randomized trial. A phenomenal um, uh, effort which was published in The Lancet uh, last year, and essentially what they did is they used the Golestan uh, cohort study, uh, which has about 50,000 uh, patients in, in, in rural Iran, and then they selected in the end uh, about 3,500 uh, patients uh, in, in, in clusters who got the polypill, and the polypill is a combination of aspirin, a cholesterol-lowering uh, agent like a statin, a blood pressure uh, lowering agent hydrochlorothiazide and then either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB is, and, uh, versus placebo. So they had about 3,500 in each uh, group and then followed them and, and looked what, what happened to patients. And they showed actually a, a, a dramatic 50% re reduction for fatal ischemic heart disease. Um, so 50% lower, you know, with the polypill approach, which is really remarkable. They showed also non-fatal ischemic heart disease uh, lower and fatal stroke rates lower, non-fatal stroke lower. Uh, and uh, they did not show any difference for non-cardiovascular cause of death. In, in fact, it was actually trending, trending at least somewhat higher with the polypill approach. And that also led to the fact that overall mortality was not different. So, so there was very, a lot of lessons learned here, um, but one is like, well, you know, it, 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 it is effective uh, but you know, the, maybe maybe some risk stratification, you know, is uh, it would be desirable uh, to make sure patients who don't need it, you know, don't get it because there are still downsides, you know, with medications, obviously side effects, etc. And so just yesterday, so this is just really uh, just off the press. Uh, just yesterday, it was presented at the American Heart Association, and it was simultaneously published in the New England Journal of Medicine was another study looking at a polypill approach uh, where they used um, um, 
a, a similar combination of, 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 of drugs uh, in patients without coronary disease history. But they, what they did is actually they, they did a risk score and then kind of focused on those patients of intermediate uh, risk. Uh, so they kind of tailored the approach and also showed uh, a, a, a reduction of, um, of uh, adverse events you know, with the polypill approach. So there's definitely merit you know, to, these, uh, to, this, uh, to this approach. Now, another way, uh, and we just sort of talk about uh, precision medicine and uh, the, the issue though is precision medicine may very well, well work if you have the resources uh, and you have a, uh, uh, you know, a very, uh, very developed um, a medical system. Uh, but you know, many places in the world, it is very difficult to do. Uh, and, and, and coronary heart disease is a global problem. It's not a problem of one specific country. And so many countries in the world, they don't have you know, the access, easy access to genetic medicine and, and, um, and, and, and very high cost procedures. Now, in many places though, one way you know, just to go further would be uh, a coronary calcium scan because CT scanners are uh, widely available. Uh, in many hospitals or most hospitals, I would should say, you know, have CT scanners, so it can be done uh, in, in many places. And it's very fast, it takes a few minutes. Uh, it's cheap, actually, even in the US, it, takes, it costs only $75 to do a coronary calcium scan, which is really quite, quite uh, inexpensive. And has low risk, low radiation, and no contrast. And again, it's widely available. So how does it work? You take a CT scan of the, of the chest, uh, specifically of the heart. You see here, this is an image of the, of the heart. This is the chest bone, so it's a cross section across the, uh, the chest at your heart level. And this is the order. And then you see part of the uh, right ventricle here. And um, here is part of the coronary. So this is only a slice, obviously. This is one slice. And you see that the, the calcification in the coronary artery, so the atherosclerotic disease, which is calcified, you now lights up very easily. So you can easily identify it and it's very easy to score and you get like a score from zero to uh, essentially indefinite uh, in terms of you know, what is the, the burden of, of calcified atherosclerotic disease. It's very well validated and gives you an assessment you know, whether you have atherosclerotic disease or not. If you don't have any, the risk is very low and you may not need you know, specific, you know, treatment for it. And so how we use it is, you know, we, we use in combination with risk assess, assessment, clinical risk assessment, in particular using it in patients who are of intermediate risk. You know, we know what to do with the very low, or very high risk patients, but in this intermediate range, you know, we be able just to further tailor uh, the, the treatment um, according to the calcium score. And so this is uh, one way which you know could be could be probably expanded you know world, worldwide. Okay, let's give me a few minutes to talk about secondary prevention. So, which is once you have the manifestation of coronary disease, what are you going to do then? So, what we need to know is what are the mechanisms leading to death from coronary artery disease in myocardial infarction (MI), uh, and then that would lead us to tools for evaluating patients. Uh, and lastly, identifying adequate treatment. Now, what I, the key message I wanna um, convey in terms of secondary prevention is that a lot of our efforts and resources uh, are misled currently because we're spending a lot of money and resources about identifying patients who have very advanced uh, forms of coronary disease. Uh, whereas if you look actually at patients who die of sudden coronary death, with SCT, sudden coronary death, um, this is an example of a very unfortunate 38-year-old woman. She uh, complained of chest pain in her apartment, and in a few hours she was dead. She was found dead. Uh, and they did an autopsy, and they found that she had a, a, a big plaque. This is one of her main you know, coronary arteries, LAD. And, uh, there was a big plaque and it, it, was, it was eroded and it, a, a clot formed based on this erosion of the plaque and, and included the artery and she had a sudden coronary death. And the point here is to, to, if you look at the narrowing in these arteries, and typically when we say 70 or greater, we, we consider it a severe narrowing. These are the ones you know, where you're placing stents or they're causing uh, chest pain. 
But, but if you look at actually the narrowings in these arteries, most of them are actually less than 70%. Um, so they are not those high grade lesions which we treat. And yet, if you look again, what we're doing, you know, we're treating these patients uh, with stents, uh, we're doing stress testing with those, and we're detecting only those who have these very high 70% of greater stenosis. Uh, and that's despite the fact, if you look at death or myocardial infarction, we treat them with stenting procedures in those with stable coronary disease. So I'm talking about stable heart disease, not those who actually have an, an acute heart attack. Um, and those a stent procedure may be helpful, but for those who don't have a, you know, a heart attack right in that moment, uh, you see that there's actually no, no benefit in terms of improving patient survival or reducing the risk of, of, of um, myocardial infarction. And, uh, and this is just a busy slide, but just this was published just a few weeks ago and included the most recent you know, ischemia trial. And this is just to show, again, this is the risk ratio. It's essentially just exactly one, uh, even including bypass surgery. There's no evidence that we're improving uh, patient survival, or reducing the risk. So you asked, why are we doing this then? Well, there's a lot of economic incentives in medicine. Unfortunately, uh, medicine uh, is a business also, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, interest in, in, in medicine in, in terms of, um, um, you know, uh, hospitals, uh, also physicians, industry, you know, benefiting uh, from certain parts of, uh, of, of, of medicine. So I'm not you know, trying to portray uh, that they you know, that folks are trying to make money of procedures, but, you know, the way it is incentivized rather right now, uh, it leads uh, to, you know, overutilization of, you know, um, procedures which are much more strongly reimbursed, they get much more money for procedures as opposed to prevention, which is not. Uh, what you see here is we, where we're spending our money. Uh, I showed you that we're spending more than $200 billion a year. Where, where, we, where we do we spend most of our money in coronary artery disease? It is here in blue. This is the breakdown for annual uh, expenditure in, in patients. And you see the blue is the biggest Portion, and that is coronary vascularization. You know, just as I told you, to stents, bypass surgery, which cost a lot of money, but actually don't really do much. What does do something, and I don't expect you to can be able to read this uh, because it's such a big table. Purposely, I showed you that there's so many data. This is the, the, the summary of data looking at the effectiveness of medical therapy for prevention of death or no or more. And we just published this a few, actually two weeks ago. So you can read all the details there, but basically it shows here that for antiplatelet therapy or for cholesterol lowering for certain medications, there's a lot of evidence that they actually reducing death or myocardial infarction. So they are effective. So why are they effective? Because the disease is, is largely driven by two things, uh, atherosclerotic disease um, or coronary heart disease. It's driven by the atherosclerotic disease burden. Uh, it is uh, driven by atherosclerotic disease activity and is driven by a, a milieu in the body that allows a thrombosis. So these are the three major factors and medical therapy addresses them. The weight lowering addresses them lowering your blood pressure addresses them, your diabetes control addresses them. So this is a systematic, systemic disease which needs to be addressed systematically. The problem again is that um, we are very bad at controlling these factors. Uh, so you see here data from, uh, from major randomized controlled trials in coronary disease. And you see here the percentage of patients who were target for the simple goals of low of, of systolic blood pressure LDL cholesterol, hemoglobin A1C, so diabetes control and smoking cessation. And, and, and on average, less than 20% of patients were at goal after one year for these simple um, you know, um, uh, objectives. And uh, although all of them um, to achieve them will, will improve patient survival, it's, it's, it's really heartbreaking that more than 80% of patients, you know, we're not getting to the simple goals because we're not incentivizing prevention, the incentivizing, you no know, procedures. Okay, um, I'm just gonna uh, wrap up here quickly because I'm a little bit over the time. 
uh, I just want to highlight that from terms of evaluation, uh, also we kind of using a lot of stress testing, you know, which detects patients at a much higher uh, uh, or more advanced disease, whereas the, there's evidence that if you look at the anatomy by CT and geography, you actually can reduce again myocardial infarction uh, by you know, addressing the disease at an earlier stage. So what we are proposing is uh, in, in, in patients, instead of you know, doing a lot of evascularization procedures, uh, to use an atomic assessment of the coronary artery disease and then based on the extent of atherosclerotic disease, uh, to do varying degrees of medical therapy and reserve uh, stenting procedures bypass to a smaller portion of patients uh, who have very high risk uh, features or really cannot be controlled with medical therapy. So, so in conclusion, so coronary artery disease remains one of the largest challenges to our societies and the morbidity and mortality and cost, they can be drastically reduced by primary and secondary prevention, there's no doubt about it. It's all in our, on, the, on our control. Uh, we just have to have the, you know, the, the will and, and, and priority just to do that. And so, so the effectiveness of these measures really depend on political will and society, societal priority. And so overall, I think resources must be shifted from often ineffective procedures to prevention. So with that, I, 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 I close and I thank you again for the opportunity to be uh, you know, part of this exciting event.